Hey everybody, this is Erica the Technology Nerd who likes to film stuff and before me I have the LG G4 and I would like to talk about it. Now I find that this phone is interesting because LG decided to be completely non-conformist this year. So I think they kind of have the market cornered right now on having a removable back cover, removable battery, and also having an SD card slot. So I do give them major props for at least trying to not conform to what everyone else has done. So what I'd like to do right now is talk about the goods, the bads, and the uglies to help you decide if this is the phone for you. So let's go ahead and get into it. So the first thing that I want to talk about here is the look and the build and the design of this phone. Now, as I mentioned, LG has decided to be very non-conformist with the stylings of their phone. We're seeing all these phones come out that are thinner, smaller, and don't have any removable parts. And this is something that's been making a lot of people very angry, at least who were fans of Samsung especially of the Galaxy S5 with that removable back cover and also SD card slot. So that's something that's a thing of the past. So LG has decided to hold on to that, but you do jeopardize appearance. We've also got this metal motif that's going on among phones that are released. HTC has always kept this metal look. They've always had quite a nice look and feel to their phones. Now Samsung is doing this metal thing and now they've thrown glass in there as well. So you are not getting thin, small, pretty, or anything with this phone, but you are getting functional. And who is to say that this phone is really that ugly? I have seen that this has a couple of different choices for back cover. I think that the leather ones look quite nice. That would have been my choice as one of the leather backs. They've got this metallic looking silver one, they've got a ceramic white, and a couple of different colors of leather. What it does offer also with those leather back covers, if you get a hold of one, is a nice curve to it. It's a very, very slight curve. It's just enough to be noticeable, but it doesn't affect the visuals of the phone. But I'm enjoying it. I really am enjoying that curve. It does give it a bit of extra style to it. One thing I want to clear up is that this is definitely not metal. What we have here is a bit of a trim. This is a plastic, but this is a chrome covered plastic. I was able to prove that by dropping it a couple of times on the floor. I was able to mangle it a little bit at the bottom and it reacts like plastic. This is definitely not metal. You can see how it's scrunched in there a little bit. I was also running on the treadmill and I smacked my earphone cord and this thing went flat down on its face, flew across the room because the treadmill threw it. And I saw that it just got the teeniest little ding here. So definitely plastic. I have to say that with as many times as I've dropped this already, that it's quite a sturdy phone, so plasticky, yet very sturdy. I do feel that it's quite easy to drop with this very smooth plastic, so I would really like to get one of those leather backings. So this is a thick, bulky phone. Let's hold it up next to some of these guys here. You can see that it's taller than the M9. Now the M9 is quite a tall phone. So it does have the M9 beat with that. And you can see the thickness there. And then we have the S6 Edge, which is a very thin phone. Feels quite light. And you can see that it's really much bigger here. And I'm sure some people will still not care or have the argument that they're gonna put a case on it anyway. So really just pick your poison. Now taking a look around the phone, just starting with this back cover, we've got these famous buttons here on the back. Now I do like how the buttons are a little bit better than what we have on the G3. I did not like this circle button. I didn't feel like I had enough distinction of where things started or ended. So I do like how this feels much more and how this is raised the way that it is. We've got our 16 megapixel camera, 1.8 aperture, very wide aperture lens here. Also optical image stabilization. We've got our laser here for autofocus. We've got our LED flash and this thing also has a sensor that measures RGB light. It tries to look at the balance of the RGB wavelengths to get the appropriate white balance. I don't know how well that works or how it works specifically, but it looks like LG is very proud of it. So I just mention it, why not? And we've got the speaker that's down here on the bottom. Not too happy that it's there. If you've got larger hands, it's probably going to be quite easy to block with your palm. But at least it does get quite loud. It sounds pretty decent, so I don't have much complaint there. Then looking at the top, we've got a microphone and IR blaster. 
Looking at the right hand side, you've just got that little groove to remove the back cover. Left hand side, there's absolutely nothing. Then here at the bottom, we have our standard headphone jack, another microphone, and also the USB charging port. This now does support Quick Charge 2.0. It was always capable of Quick Charge 2.0, but LG mentioned at the beginning that it didn't have it. So now it looks like they've had a firmware upgrade that helps get that going. So when you get your retail models, you should expect Quick Charge 2.0 to be in order and working and charging nice and fast for you. So this kind of is the ultimate phone for some people who don't want to go down these avenues here. So now let's talk about specs and performance. What we have here in terms of specs is a Snapdragon 808 SoC inside of this thing. This has a hexa-core CPU. So we've got two cores that are clocked at 1.82 gigahertz. Those are your Cortex-A57s. And then you have four cores that are clocked at 1.44 gigahertz. Those are your Cortex-A53s. So those are your lower powered cores. Two higher powered cores and four lower powered cores. And then we've got the Adreno 418 GPU inside of this, three gigabytes of RAM. So I feel what's been going on with Qualcomm has been laced with controversy. Now, inside of the M9, we have the S810 SoC, and Qualcomm has been having some issues with this, whether it be heating or whatever else. It looks like LG decided to not use the S810 and go with a little bit lower powered processor inside of this thing. So do I really feel that we're missing a lot in performance for not having an S810 SoC inside of this thing? Really? No, not really. When looking at the performance around the interface, I've been really quite happy with what I'm seeing. Everything does feel really quite nice and smooth to me. The performance has been very nice. It does feel smoother than the LG G3 to me. If we want to get real technical and see what the frame drops actually look like, we can go underneath developer options and we can scroll downward. Profile GPU rendering on screen as bars. And we have this little green line here. Anything that goes above the green line represents a drop frame. If it's a tall bar, then it represents many drop frames. So we can just scroll through here and you can see that it looks pretty good. Going out of here, we can go about the home screens. So you can see that once we hit underneath this smart bulletin thing, I do see a bit more drop frames. But otherwise, it feels pretty darn good. Once in a while, you have some drop frames here and there. Then I see we've got bouts of it looking really quite nice. So I don't have much to complain about. Now, of course, once you go underneath the task switcher here or your recent applications, we do see a bit more drop frames. This is kind of a standard thing I'm seeing with lollipop features. But otherwise, it's been quite a nice and smooth experience. That S808 SoC is more than powerful enough to deal with the amount of pixels on this display. Now in the world of benchmarking, LG realizes that their device is not as powerful as the S810 or even Samsung's device here, which really does pretty well and quite a bit better. I think it's been still a powerful device. Sometimes when I compare benchmarks with the M9, I see that in some CPU-based benchmarks, that this device actually does better than the M9 in some circumstances. As far as the GPU scores go, I can see that the M9 does quite a bit better than the G4. This is just looking at off-screen tests. Of course, where there's a real difference is just with how many pixels that this display has to push around. So with on-screen, you can really see that the M9 does kick the butt of this poor little G4. What really matters to me though is just daily life and in gameplay, and I think that the G4 has done just splendidly. I really love using an application that is called GameBench to benchmark applications, actual games for instance. So here I have Riptide GP2, and I have everything turned up in terms of graphics in this game here. So I have everything maxed out in terms of graphics, and we're looking at the performance in terms of the median frame rate. And with the G4, we've got 29 frames per second, and we've got a median frame rate of 26 frames per second on the M9. And you can see that there's a lot more CPU resources being used on the G4, and a lot more GPU resources being used. But I see that the trend looks pretty similar and that the G4 is able to hold its own here. So just because we do have a lower powered SoC in comparison to some of the other devices that have come out doesn't mean that it does terrible in gameplay, not in my experience. And of course, this has a ton of pixels to push around on top of having a lower powered SoC than this. 
So here we can see with some games like Asphalt 8 that yes, the M9 does perform better. But then again, in some highly graphic intensive games, you can see that the G4 still really does hold its own here. Another thing that I really admire about the LG G4 is just how fast it is at opening applications, especially in comparison to this M9 here. So we're just waiting and it loads very quickly. And then finally, we've got this one popping up at some point. And again, we have a CSR Racing. Let's go ahead and tap it like so. And just wait and see. So that's finished. Then this is still going. And finally, come on, come on, come on, come on. There you go. You see just how long that takes. I think all that I'm seeing and showing here just goes to show that if I had to choose between the performance of the M9 versus the G4, I would go for the G4. So now I would love to talk about this display here. I have to say thank you, LG, so much for getting rid of that sharpening. They just completely over sharpened this display on the G3 and it looks terrible. It looks so bad. There are sharpening halos on everything. I wanted to always stab my eyeballs out anytime I was looking at content on this display because of those over sharpening halos. You don't do that. You have a high enough resolution display. There is absolutely no need. I ended up finding that with such crazy over sharpening that this display somehow looked lower resolution than what it actually is. Instead of being that 538 PPI display, it just looks pretty bad. So voila, here we have a much better result. This just looks so much more toned down. There is no needing for eye stabbage going on here. Take a look at this. Then take a look at that. The difference is pretty extreme. So gone is that sharpening and thank you. I can look at this display. This is a 5.5 inch IPS display. Pretty decent viewing angles. So let's talk about display quality and I know that I am notoriously known for being pretty picky about my displays and the color accuracy and how content looks on these displays. This is a wide gamut display. They call this a quantum display. So essentially the standard of displays that we have right now, the color space is called sRGB Rec 709. And so the colors with sRGB meet inside this triangle, this black triangle here. Well, what I've measured with this LG G4 is that we are going outside this triangle here. So we've got a wider gamut and LG is calling this color space DCI. I'm actually thinking that they're talking about DCI P3 because DCI in itself means absolutely nothing. That's just a cinema standard where they try to get projectors to have a quality control, if you will. So DCI P3 would be the actual color space. What LG happens to claim is that this wider color space, because it can produce more color, it has more color here, is that it makes it more accurate because the human eye can see more color. That's actually not accurate. Let's just look at what they have to say. The display on the new G4 uses IPS quantum technology to produce accurate color with impressive contrast ratios for the next level of detail. Well, here's the problem. All the content that we have in the internet is encoded for sRGB. Our movies are sRGB. So Netflix, YouTube, even to DVD, you have sRGB Rec 709. So what happens when you take content that has been encoded for sRGB and you put it to a wider gamut display? Well, what it's going to do is essentially take all these colors here and stretch them out further and you're going to get oversaturated colors. Let's see what Technicolor has to say about DCI P3. So they say DCI-P3 refers to the color space used in digital movie theaters and encompasses much more than sRGB. Hollywood films are provided to theater in DCI-P3 in order to match the gamut of the digital projection equipment that is used. Currently, DCI-P3 content is limited to digital movie theaters and is not available to consumers. So you have LG who is claiming, yes, you can watch movies now and it will conform to our DCI P3 display and it will look more accurate than these other displays that are sRGB. 
And that's not true because the content that we have is sRGB. As they're telling you right here, you need to have content that has been encoded for the thing that's displaying the content. If you have two different color spaces, they don't match, it's called color space mismatch, and you're going to get colors that are oversaturated, undersaturated, it's just not going to be accurate. So what LG is saying here is just horse poo, it doesn't mean anything. None of your movies are going to suddenly look more accurate on this display. None of Netflix or YouTube is going to look more accurate on this display. In fact, when you're watching movies or anything on this display, greens are going to look oversaturated, reds are going to look oversaturated. I think it creates a nice effect, but it's not accurate. It's certainly not accurate. So nice try, marketing. They always try to do something like this. So does this mean that I don't like this display? No, no, actually, I quite like this display. It's not accurate like they're claiming, but it does have quite a nice effect. I do like my greens kind of punchy and popping, a little bit guilty. And I find that more reds looks interesting, but I do see that skin tones can look a little bit off. Skin tones can look more red than they should. So I did take some pictures of my monitor. I got a little bit lazy here, but otherwise this display looks quite bluish. The whites, the white point is very, very blue. You can see that it's over 8,000 Kelvin. It's 8,479. That's what I've measured mine as. I don't think that the gamma is too bad. It looks like they're kind of trying to target 2.2 2 or 2.1. It should be along 2.2. So it looks like they tried to do something here. It's really not too bad. They also claim that this display is brighter than the LG G3. Now on my measurements, they're actually the same brightness pretty much. This is just at 100% brightness, so I wonder if there is some variability in the panel brightness or if they're talking about the auto brightness. So looking at it visually, to myself, this looks like the same brightness with this display. They weren't lying about the contrast ratio though. It does have a much nicer contrast ratio than the LG G3, so you've got a bit nicer blacks there. So I think that this is something cool, something different, but it's really no different than looking at some of the Samsung displays that have a lot of color to them. But at least Samsung does provide you with an sRGB kind of mode that's kind of close to sRGB standard. So recap, no, the calibration here does not conform to any useful standard. So all your content is going to look oversaturated in the reds and in the greens. It's going to create an interesting effect. You have to decide whether you like it or not. I do like that on my display that the gamma looks like they're trying to conform to at least around 2.2. These displays look quite bluish. The white point is really quite cool. We do have a nice contrast ratio and I do appreciate that. So you really just need to decide what you think about this display yourself. Go and check it out, go and see it. But ultimately, when I'm watching content, I notice that people's skin tones are a bit redder than they should be. That would be my overlying complaint. Now moving on to talking about the interface here. They call this UX 4.0. This is Android version 5.1. So we've got Lollipop. Now they talk about how they've downsized and gotten rid of some of the bloat in the user interface, like Samsung has done with the Galaxy S6. But in all honesty, I haven't noticed any difference. Everything looks still the same to me. We've got apps, widgets, this all looks the same. Everything here still looks the same. When you go underneath settings, everything looks the same. It looks like they have taken away just a couple of the features, such as the motion type features and things like that. They've decided to get rid of just a few things, but at a glance I would not notice any difference whatsoever. One thing that I do notice that is different and that I like are these smart settings. I think these are genius, love these. So you've got settings for when at home, so you can just use your GPS location and say that wherever your address is your home, and you can have it do certain things when you're away. What I really like is this part down here at the bottom. So I go to the gym a lot and I like to set my phone up on the treadmill, plug my earphones in and watch some Netflix as I'm running. So a nice benefit for me when running is to just be able to plug in the headphones at the bottom. I don't have to fiddle with anything. I don't have to search for Netflix. It just pulls it up right away and you can put whatever application you need. If it's music, you can put music. So I do find that to be really, really nice. 
I also have a Bluetooth stereo and I like to be able to connect this to it so when I turn on Bluetooth, it's going to open up Google Play Music. So these are a couple of nice features and just say that you are away from home and you want this to be on vibrate when you're at work, it'll automatically just put it on vibrate for you as soon as you leave the door. Another admirable feature that LG has had for a while is this knock code, this security code. So if you have the phone that's off, you can set yourself a knocking combination. So just say lower quadrant here, lower right quadrant, one, two, three, four. It's going to unlock my phone and turn it on at the same time. So I really do like that. I also like that we don't always have to push the button on the back. If we want to, we can just double tap on that home screen and it will turn off. And if you were underneath an application on the phone, you can still double tap, but it's going to have to be in this bar along the top, your status bar. You can just double tap it and it turns off. So that's always been something that I've really, really liked. Now, of course, we've also got the dual window feature. So you hit dual window here. And then you can pick two different applications and you can use two applications at the same time. So this has been something that's been around for a while. So say YouTube and uh, gallery combination, for example. So then we can touch right here. You can get rid of whichever window that you choose. You can expand and make a window larger. You can get back to your selection here. So you can pick something else. So let's just pick, I don't know, file manager. And then you can switch them as well. So this has always been a handy feature. Otherwise, this is just a skinned lollipop. We don't have the ability to hit the volume rocker and get access to our priority mode. That's something that kind of annoys me because I don't like to go and have to fiddle in here and find the area where I've got this all interruptions or priority mode. So you can see it's right there. I have seen that all the other lollipop features are on this phone. It's just got LG's bit of flair to it. Screen pinning is underneath the security settings here. You've also got your ability to get to profiles. So overall, just pretty standard. So again, the interface really doesn't look any different to me, but I think it's fine. So now I think this would be a good stopping point. I'm going to have a part two of this video that's going to be talking about the camera battery life and some other things. There are some questions that I have to ask LG about the camera. I am waiting for some confirmations from them. This is relating to the 4K video and the bitrate of the 4K video, which is quite low, only 30 megabits per second, and that's kind of the same that was on the G3. And I'm kind of curious if it's like that between all models of this phone that are coming out because I'm seeing some people have better results than I am. So stay tuned for part two. This has been Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what you think about this phone so far. Is this the phone for you so far? Let me know.